And we're going to start with kind of the current state, how we got here. Where are we today? What is the current state of additive manufacturing technology and those associated supply chains? From a digital enterprise, the technologies to link the design and the machine, and even how does this integrate with workers? So I'm going to start at the beginning with our research experts. So I'm going to start with Dr. Ger Gary Fetter, Gary, and also Dr. Craig Blue. Your work at Carnegie Mellon University, where Dr. Gary Fetter is an associate, or not associate, process, research, you'll tell us, the director of the Manufacturing Futures Institute, and Dr. Blue is working at the National Laboratory. You've been at the forefront of research into additive manufacturing technologies. Can you please first give us some background? And then tell us, what are you working now that could or will change the future of the industry? How has your work enabled the industry's growth to date? And where is it going? So Gary, we we'll start with you, please. Sure. Thank you, Petra. And thank you, everyone, for uh, coming to this event. We're very excited to be here. I think for um, Carnegie Mellon, we have a great legacy of working in, in additive manufacturing that started uh, in the 1990s with uh, Professor Lee Weiss and, and Fritz Prince, and they were working on things like solid freeform fabrication and polymers, also on cold spray <coughs> technologies to, to build hybrid metal structures. So that was a long, long time ago when a lot of these things, Petra, you're talking about were a twinkle in our eye. Uh, to where we are now. You know, I don't think then anyone was thinking even $12 billion business was, was going to happen. Um, so a lot has happened since then, and I think an inflection point was around 2012. Uh, we got uh, very much uh, uh, deeply more involved with uh, uh, scaling out our, uh, our work in metals additive manufacturing, and a lot of that also triggered at the time uh, the uh, emergence of America Makes is our first manufacturing innovation institute that John's going to talk about later as well, I'm sure. So lots of legacy, a lot of exciting uh, uh, things have happened since then, and we've, we have focused a lot on metals. Uh, it, it's a huge uh, opportunity in business. Um, I think for us, the, the research, if I had to just do a soundbite, I'd say it's primarily been focused uh, on scaling up the technology so that one can make uh, parts uh, again and again and maybe with you know you take a different machine in a different place you're going to get the same part when you do that in subtractive it's obvious you run it you know you've got a block of metal you're going to get the right thing out that's not the case necessarily in additive there's a lot that wraps around that in terms of qualification certification control and we've been working on those technologies um, and so I think a little later on we can dive into more details about that. Sounds great. Thank you, Gary. And um, this one? Yeah, okay. I uh, just want to, um, you know, I asked you about um, what are you working on now? And so maybe you could, this is a good time to introduce the Manufacturing Futures Institute and the kind of work that you're doing uh, in Mill 19. And maybe tell us about Mill 19 as well. Oh, sure. I'd love to do that. Uh, so with Carnegie Mellon, uh, has uh, built out uh, the Manufacturing Futures Institute. This is what I, I lead at Carnegie Mellon. It's an organization within Carnegie Mellon to pull all the researchers across the university. Think of people from computer science, policy, but also in mechanical engineering and other engineering disciplines so that we do this 4IR type of technology uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the university environment. Bricks and mortar, we've, we've built a, uh, what we call the, our Mill 19 facility, which is on the other river. We're on the Allegheny, so if you go over to the Monongahela River, uh, we have a, a facility that's built out of the uh, old uh, Jones and Laughlin, uh, one, one of the steel mill buildings of the old Jones and Laughlin uh, uh, steel mill. And uh, there we have, uh, we're co-located with the Advanced Robotics for Manufacturing Institute, as well as Catalyst Connection. Petra is up, up above us, a, a floor above us. And we work on all aspects of manufacturing. We have a very large um, metals additive manufacturing facility with uh, various equipment, uh, as well as uh, room for expansion on our robotics uh, technologies. So we've really been working on primarily um, 
intelligent robotics with humans for manufacturing, the additive aspects that's kind of the topic of this uh, uh, panel, as well as uh, expanding into digital twin technologies is one of our big focuses now. And that really spills over into robotics additive in all of these areas. I think for us, a lot of the future technology is about how do we create the digital twins, the digital twin systems that connect to the digital backbone, collect the right data, and start pushing toward, especially how do we create opportunities for manufacturing and the services that manufacturers can provide with these new technologies. So that's, in a nutshell, that's what we're pushing toward. Thank you, Gary. And so Dr. Blue, if you could tell us about your work similarly, give us some background. How did you get here and what are some of the exciting things happening now? Okay, well, building, first of all, thanks for uh, having me uh, here today, it's an honor. Um, I'll, I'll date myself a little bit. I built the first additive machine at Oak Ridge in 1995. And uh, that was the second time through for additive, right? I mean, additive even predated myself. And then uh, in about 2008, uh, we retooled and um, kind of a surge back into additive across a multitude of disciplines from the polymer over into the metal. And then we launched the manufacturing demonstration facility at Oak Ridge in 2011. Um, a public-private partnership, really working side by side with the supply chain, the equipment manufacturers, providing rapid access to not only state-of-the-art technology, but state-of-the-art staff. Um, the technology is the technology, but really having that, that know-how. Um, it's grown. We started with about six or eight people. It's about 150 people now um, and has had a pretty strong history of working side by side with industry and spinning technologies out. Um, 2013 time frame, working with a variety of uh, individuals, uh, came up with the, the large scale polymer additive manufacturing, big additive ad, uh, uh, manufacturing, and then that really being pushed into a lot of the tooling area. Um, some real fundamental work there that enabled that and scaling. Um, a lot of fundamental work around powder beds. Um, I like to look at additive manufacturing as a rapid preforming tool. So uh, the machine shops are not going to go out of business. Matter of fact, it will drive more machining if you ask me. Uh, but really what additive brings to the table is the ability to control your mechanical properties and your microstructure in three dimensions. And that's something that we've been heavily focused on. And then uh, as was previously mentioned, a real focus on the digital thread, actually driving everything on the front end from modeling, um, all your data analytics, tracking things spatially and temporally to make sure that you can make the same part reliably again and again. So I think it's an exciting time. And the equipment manufacturers are evolving. Your machine tool companies are moving into the space. And I think that's really where the industry is going to get more robust. Thank you. Uh, so you just heard kind of from the beginning of the value chain, our research experts. Uh, let's talk now for, with industry. So we have two representatives here. Uh, if you could please introduce yourselves, Ron and Ed. You each tell us uh, about your company, and then tell us about your additive manufacturing journey. And I think more importantly, if you could tell us why are you in this additive manufacturing journey? What's the benefit that you're seeing at your company? So perhaps we could start with Ron. Okay. Hello, thank you for having me here. I am Ron Josefchuk, uh, Vice President for Global Manufacturing for Elliott Group. Uh, we are a manufacturer and servicer for turbo machinery, uh, manufacturing uh, power turbines, uh, process gas compressors, and uh, cryogenic pumps used in the oil and gas, petrochemical, and LNG field. Uh, our uh, company actually has its uh, headquarters located about 30 miles from here in Jeanette, Pennsylvania. Uh, with one of our manufacturing facilities as well as a near duplicate facility uh, in Sadagora, Japan, right outside of Tokyo. Uh, in terms of additive manufacturing, the journey for our company, uh, we've actually started uh, trying to employ additive manufacturing, I'd say, beginning about eight, nine years ago. And uh, one of the, the key items that we were looking at from, from an additive manufacturing standpoint was, was cycle time. Um, when we look at what we do for our industries, the overall cycle time it takes to get material in, go through a subtractive uh, process, and then full assembly uh, tends to push out our lead times extremely long, especially on our service uh, sector for our business. So 
you know, with a customer who's able to have a, a plant go down due to a failure at site, uh, you're not going to have every kind of part uh, globally stocked for these items. But so the key for us was it was getting to a point that we were able to do a quick turnaround on a replacement. So so that really goes down the additive manufacturing path. Uh, from there, we wanted to pull that into our, our new product equipment and processing. And as we started going down that journey, I think it was already mentioned that uh, initially the thought was we're going to be able to combine processes, eliminate steps, eliminate machining, uh, but we've already found, uh, I was mentioned earlier here about with machining, that that's really not going to be the path that we're going to see from an additive uh, process. We were able to uh, reduce our cycle times, uh, overall remove a lot of the dwell times that's within our industry. Uh, majority of the time when you look at for a, for a overall machining step is actually not the machining itself, it's the dwell time between the steps. So by removing most of those, by consolidating our designs, uh, we're able to, to, to greatly uh, uh, improve the response time for our customers. Now, areas where we're still exploring, though, is that there has still been uh, many, I don't want to say holdups, uh, but drawbacks for, for additive manufacturing, which we're still trying to uh, overcome. Uh, much of our equipment is uh, rather large in size. We're, we're currently shipping a compressor that's uh, about 500,000 pounds. So the additive manufacturing space has not yet grown to those areas, at least not from, from what people traditionally think is powder, you know, uh, powder bed manufacturing and some of the um, uh, uh, bonded ones. But uh, for us, we're also exploring um, non-traditional uh, additive manufacturing, so uh, combinations of uh, submer you know, submerged arc welding within process machining, uh, thin foil, uh, ultrasonically bonded uh, materials which can be built up. And the, the key thing that we're really focusing on now is how we actually change our designs for additive manufacturing. We're starting to get to a stable platform of technologies that we can now look at, not just replacing uh, a previous process, but now how we actually leverage the benefits of additive manufacturing to create a new, better product that we couldn't do with, with traditional machining processes. Wow, that's exciting. That's great. Thank you. How about um, Ed? Thanks, What's, Petra. Yeah. So uh, I'm Ed Rusnicka. Uh, I'm Director of Engineered Solutions at Kenametal, also a local company. Um, Kenametal is an industrial technology provider founded here in, uh, in western Pennsylvania and, and really based on material science innovation. Um, so, Kenna Metal has two segments. We have the metal cutting segment, um, you know, and I, I mentioned the material science innovation. That was cemented tungsten carbide. So we have our metal cutting segment and we have what we call our infrastructure segment where we focus on, uh, say, wear components and wear solutions. So, you know, what, what led Kenna Metal down the additive path? I mean, I, for us, you know, we were looking at how can we provide, similar to what Ron said, you know, taking advantage of the benefits of additive. But we were very focused and very intentional with how we looked at it. So we started the journey about 10 years ago um, and, and said, you know, let's, let's look at something, a material system, a tool steel that we can use in our manufacturing and realize a product design. Um, so so that's, that's something that's been in production now for about four years at one of our steel plants. I mean, we make thousands of additively manufactured uh, modular drill tool bodies um, every month. So that's something, and, and why did we do it? You know, so we did that because of the design capabilities and the design freedom of additive. It allowed us to provide through coolant through that drill body for very small diameters that we couldn't do by conventional methods. You know, so, so that was an advantage. Um, and I mentioned being focused. You know, we said this is a material that's advantageous to our business. You know, so when we did that, we have that blueprint, we worked that, we showed the benefit you know, um, internally to our internal manufacturing. All that was done within technology. So we had a, a pilot plant essentially within technology and as we developed the capability in, in the, you know, the material, in the process, in the post finishing, then we took that and we integrated that into our current manufacturing. You know, so we don't have a specific additive um, uh, business for our, uh, for our uh, metal cutting business. We integrated into manufacturing because we have the other capability there. Now with the cemented tungsten carbides, it's a different process needed because it's, it's a, it's a non-weldable material, it's a powdered metal, 
Um, you know, we have many, many methods to do that today. So we're developing that today for the for not only our own use, but we offer that to our customers as well. You know, so we have a a, a small business unit within a company where specifically for our infrastructure side of the business, uh, a lot of oil and gas exploration, uh, mining, construction, where we can provide where solutions uh, with additive. Once again, offering that design freedom. You know, so we have very focused on, on two carbide grades that we offer um, and, and provide those components finished for our customers. So what led me here, you know, so I, I like personally, you know, I, I uh, kind of dating myself, like, like Craig said, um, you know, in the 90s, I worked for a small private company that had the original license from MIT for binder jetting, you know, so, and then, you know, my career led me to Kenametal and when they had, said, hey, Ed, we need a technology leader for additive. And, and, you know, we understand that you have some experience with this. I'm like, yeah, my experience, guys, is dated. This technology is changing so fast. But, you know, I was super excited to be able to get back into it and have the opportunity to work with additive. And going from the, the, the very beginning that we did with the binder jetting and now seeing how we apply it and actually use it, you know, to solve our customers' problems has been, been really rewarding. So. That's great. I could talk about it all day, so I Good. should probably let some other people talk. <laughs> Thank you, Ed. So our last two panelists are both named John, so it'll be easy for us to remember. So we're going to start with John Wazinski. John, you're the director of America Makes, um, and I'm characterizing it as an ecosystem type building entity. So uh, you know, please clarify that if you don't agree. But I'd like you to tell us a little bit about America Makes. And yesterday on one of the panels, uh, one of our panelists alluded to this Manufacturing USA Institutes that we have in our country, but we really didn't dive into that. So maybe if you could take an opportunity to tell us about that uh, system in our country, and then America Makes, please. Absolutely. Well, <clears throat> first of all, thank you for, for having me here today. Um, I'm, as mentioned, from America Makes, we're part of a network of institutes. So there's, as mentioned by Petra, something called Manufacturing USA. And what that is, is a collection of different institutes focused on different advanced manufacturing technologies. There are now 16 different institutes that exist and recently announced there's actually a open uh, RFP for a, a new institute uh, currently out being competed. But each of us is fundamentally focused on, like Petra mentioned, building a ecosystem. So we, we've, for the most part, been characterized as organizations which are maturing research and development around a particular technology. So the institute I represent is called America Makes, and it is focused on additive manufacturing or 3D printing. There is another uh, institute here resident in Pittsburgh called the ARM Institute, which is focused on robotics, and then there's a number of other different technologies where we've, the government of the U.S. has identified a need to build, or excuse me, bring together and build a community. So we think of ourselves, and, and all of the institutes think this way, of a convener. So we are in place to bring the community together and really not just bring them together, but identify what needs to be worked on. So fundamentally, all of us are trying to, we are um, considered public-private partnerships. So we're working across government, industry, and academia, nonprofits, and bringing all of them together to identify what challenges need to be addressed together. And where are there problems that we can work on together so that if we solve these problems, we can move the entire industry forward. And so we're, we're not necessarily targeting a very specific solution that, you know, one of these companies might be interested in, but we're kind of a step above that trying to identify if we can solve this fundamental problem, whether it's related to materials or processing or speed or the design aspects of a technology, we'll be able to get that disseminated out more broadly than in an individual organization solving a problem. So that's, that's what we're all established to do. We've been working at that uh, at America Makes for 10 years now. Um, we're, we're the oldest of the 16 institutes that exist. And we're you know, fundamentally trying to bring people together, identify what we need to work on, and actually coordinate a response and do something about it. And we, we do that in a variety of different ways. You know, 
through bringing people together to try to truly understand what the voice of industry is, so that we're working on the right challenges. But you know, the key is that we're focusing on those challenges that it makes sense for us to work on them together. There's plenty of problems that don't make sense to be you know, executed through a public-private partnership. So we're trying to understand where can we make an impact and then address those, those areas. So we've, we've been working hard at that, trying to, I think some of our current challenges, uh, both the, the folks who represent research organizations we work with regularly, are related to you know, availability of materials data. That's one of the biggest challenges I think we face as an industry right now is it's, it's expensive and generally not available and then you start to, you know, if you peel that back uh, further, you start to uncover some of what Gary was talking about, our ability to truly understand what's happening within a machine or within a system and then if we pick that up and move it to the system literally next to it within a facility, do we understand what we're getting out of that? So there are, there are challenges that are community is, uh, I guess that's enough for me, um, you know, that, that our research community is working on, but where we come in is then, you know, being part of that work, but it's also important that we're building the, edu you know, an educated workforce, and that means folks who are currently in the educational system, as well as considering how do we, how do we reskill and upskill our existing workforce that exists, so some of what Petra mentioned, you know, it, our future 10 and 20 and 30 years from now, organizations that are manufacturing a particular way today may not be manufacturing the exact, they won't be, you know, in, in 10 and 20 years. Whether, you know, how dramatically different it is or isn't, you know, we'll, we'll see, but we're focused on that. But maybe the most important piece is we're now seeing the need for a community. You know, we, we've developed the technology to the point that it is meaningful in certain application spaces and we can use it and we're training a workforce so we're making progress there but what we're finding is there's not a supply chain you know that, that's kind of where we're at today is there is not a reliable supply chain in additive manufacturing so th those are some of the areas that we're you know attempting to address at the institute thank you john and i think that's a great segue to our last panelist here john barnes uh, John, I know you're an expert in this field. You've been working in it for a long time with the Barnes Group, and now you're uh, CEO of another of a powders company, and you're also part of the Neighborhood 91. So as I mentioned earlier, we have an entire neighborhood dedicated to additive manufacturing here in our community. So could you please uh, tell us about your role and tell us about the neighborhood? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I always say our, our role is uh, we deal with elegant complexity. So we, we you know, we're, we're a a small company, uh, Barnes Global Advisors. We specialize in advanced manufacturing, but we've, uh, we've got a strong specialty in additive manufacturing, which for groups like this, we actually just call it addictive manufacturing, because I remember when we brought Christina Casotas to see one of the first printers, you know, you just, she, she was peeled to the glass, because they couldn't believe that this was actually making parts. Um, so uh, we're, we're sort of the largest you know, group of our kind, you know, as an independent engineering organization, and we help uh, just about everybody at this table at some some connection, except for Ron, whom I have ideas, but um, <laughs> I'll give you a card afterwards. Uh, so we, we got involved with Neighborhood 91 largely because we, we recognize what John was saying. So, you know, like we're members of America Makes, uh, and the supply chain issue, uh, so this is before the pandemic, before Suez Canal, before you know extreme weather conditions kind of set in. Uh, Pittsburgh is unique because if you draw a circle, you know, around two hours and then maybe four hours around it, the entire supply chain for metal additive manufacturing exists, but it's not really connected. So uh, we met uh, first meeting that we had uh, with uh, the airport authority and the University of Pittsburgh, Chancellor Gallagher. Uh, we, we just kind of tossed out this concept that what if we just took that and t boiled it down into this 200-acre campus, you know, built a small, you know, supply chain ecosystem. And that's really what catalyzed the thought. Uh, so we, we then went to go talk to the different uh, partners out there. We, we went and talked to Carnegie Mellon. We went and talked to the University of Pittsburgh. We talked to other entities in the region. And, uh, you know, it's really been like, uh, you know, pretty fast-paced. Uh, now we've got the first 45,000 square foot building 
not only is up, uh, it's fully leased. We've got four different companies in there, one of whom has been manufacturing and exporting parts since uh, March of last year. Uh, so, um, you know, when you're involved in it day by day, it seems like it's moving slowly, but we didn't even have this concept three and a half years ago. So, uh, John and I have participated on panels before, and I have my very favorite question I like to ask him. Uh, John, you're sitting next to Gary, you talked about Mill 19, you're talking about Neighborhood 91, and my question is, have we run out of numbers in Pittsburgh? Why do we have Mill 19? Can you tell us why are we calling it Neighborhood 91? Yeah, so uh, Christina Casotis alluded to this earlier, and so uh, as uh, oddly, uh, Christina and I moved to Pittsburgh about the same time, uh, the same year, and uh, we actually are neighbors uh, to one another, but uh, that's kind of coincidental. Only in Pittsburgh. Only in happened. Pittsburgh would that happen. <laughs> so uh, as newcomers to Pittsburgh, you learn very quickly that there's 90 distinct neighborhoods in, in Pittsburgh, and so when we were c trying to come up with the name, you know, Naturally, we were thought, well, well, we'll try to come up with a clever acronym or something like that. And I thought we decided to go in a different direction. And uh, somebody came up with the idea that this will be the 91st neighborhood. And so then it, it kind of stuck because it really resonated with what we're trying to accomplish, which is, you know, rather than having a bunch of companies that, that are just next to one another, we're, we're really trying to build that system much like Silicon Valley. So it's these companies are part of an innovation system. They're not just uh, sort of peripheral to one another, but if, you know, you make it very difficult for one to leave, it's like pulling a thread out of a quilt, it doesn't, doesn't work that easily. Uh, so we were very conscious of Mill 19, and one of the first meetings that we had was with one of Gary and mine's uh, colleagues, Sandra DeVincent Wolf, and we explained what we were about, which is more production, uh, not research and development, but clearly if you have production, you always have needs to be solved. And so from the very beginning, we're, we're Mill 19, uh, you know, kind of the idea is, I think this is unique to Pittsburgh a little bit too. So we can go invent things at CMU and, and University of Pittsburgh. They go to Mill 19, Hazel Green to get developed. And then if they're additive, they go to uh, na uh, Neighborhood 91 for production. So we've got the final mile. So, and really that's 400 acres of uh, development all happening in Pittsburgh, which I don't think can be rivaled anywhere in North America. So Mill 19 has its own interesting story because it was Mill 19. I think the Sanders got a great story around this. It dates back to, you know, pre-World War II. Yeah, I think it was just building 19 in the entire steel complex yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah, there's a 168-acre brownfield, yeah, and which used to be a, the bustling factory for steel that uh, from the 1800s and then yeah it fueled also world the world wars right yeah. in terms of the steel production in the US absolutely so so thank you for that so we've heard about the you know exciting things going on in industry and research and so forth but let's get real so we just talked about earlier that mm -hmm. industry is not moving at the rapid pace that it was projected so uh, you know again let's go back to industry let's talk to Ron and Ed what is really preventing you? What, what do you need? What is preventing you from that widespread adoption of technologies? And you know, is it raw materials? Is it design tools? Is it the workers, the supply chain? Tell us what's preventing you from really accelerating the pace of this adoption. So from, from our industry perspective, uh, the, the key thing that has prevented our industry has been uh, two areas, scalability, um, as we mentioned, a lot of our items that we manufacture are very, are very large in scale. And uh, as most of the technologies ha have been increasing, we've seen the, the focus on increasing, you know, reducing production time, but not as much on terms of increasing the scale size. And as we start to look at what our parameters are, where we're looking at using 3D printing, uh, other additive manufacturing, one of the items that we're always looking at is the amount of surface area we have versus the total solid volumes to really determine where we're going to be able to apply this, this technology. Mm -hmm. And as you go through these curves, as you go larger and larger on the scales, uh, and you look at the, the economics of this, it starts to become actually more beneficial still to use a subtractive one when you have a large solid volume rather than building this all up from particles and uh, uh, then only having the, the benefit of the surface. So, uh, that's been one of our, our, our first areas. Uh, a second one has actually just been industry standards in general. So 
Uh, we work within the petrochemical, oil and gas fields primarily, and this is a heavily regulated uh, industry and also very risk averse. Uh, whenever you're dealing with, with a petrochemical plant, both from a safety standpoint as well as also from a production standpoint, adoption of new technology takes time. Uh, most of our customers require uh, pilot programs that have prototypes that have then also been uh, proven in non-critical services uh, times up to three years before you can go into a full production scale. So that in itself has held back a little bit of the, uh, the pace of advancement. Realistically though, the, the major one that we've had in our industry, uh, everybody's taken a look at, at the additive manufacturing. You see the very rapid um, you know, production of, of samples uh, we use it for, for our R&D department to quickly come up with, with new uh, uh, prototypes to test in our laboratory. But when you start to look at it from, from a very uh, uh, micro scale, um, overall, there, there are still some drawbacks to additive manufacturing. Anytime you're, you're putting together small pieces and we're either uh, bonding them or welding them together, you do have some limitations as to what we're able to do in terms of surface finish, in terms of, of our overall geometric tolerancing we are able to maintain. And we have not yet been able to get to that level uh, with additive manufacturing where we can go to a completely finished product. So now we still have to still have at least a couple steps of, of traditional manufacturing. Uh, this has actually been one of the, the holdups to getting to a, a truly uh, point of use additive manufacturing uh, environment for us that we still have to go through back through traditional manufacturing for, for very tight tolerance or, or uh, polished surfaces. So um, overall, it, we're seeing a, a, a directional change, um, but until we get the processes up that we can finish or, or remove that final finishing step, uh, we don't see ourselves being able to make that final leap to uh, pretty much production at, at the point of use with our customers. Okay, thank you, Ed. So uh, a lot of the same things that Ron talked about, um, but you know, him and I got a chance to chat a little bit beforehand, and it's interesting because um, in his business, he's dealing with very large components. We're dealing typically with very small components, so we have different challenges. I, I think one of the Really one of the big ones that I see even internally at companies, you know, is really being intentional with the need for additive and understanding the value of it in that portion of the business. You know, because I have, I think instead of, uh, or at least years ago it was, hey, let's, it's additive technology, let's find a place to use it. You know, and now I, I think we really need to follow, just like you would any other technology development or business development, you have to be very intentional with it and say, you know, what's the need? What's the value to my customers? What's the value to my business? And, and how do I provide that? Because we're to the point now, like I said, we've been utilizing additive for many years in our manufacturing. And my customers, in, in these cases, don't care if it's additive manufactured. They're looking at a solution for their, their problem. And if I can utilize add, additive to do that, it's like a bonus, you know, it's like, I've had many customers come to me and say, we didn't know that was an additive part. I'm like, well, that's, that's not our value. You know, our value is solving your problems. And so I think that's one of the, you know, kind of backing up, that's one of the big things is even internally, it, it's, I think uh, inhibits a lot of businesses because they're really looking for, for you know, developing the technology first and then trying to figure out what I do with it. Um, so I think that's a key. Um, the other one that, that we're very fortunate, you know, Kenna Metal has its own powder manufacturing capability. It has, you know, we have heat treating capability, we have finishing capability and all these materials. So it's really a complementary part of our business. A lot of my customers that, that you know, they say, Ed, you know, we're, we want to we utilize additive manufacturing in our business. How are you guys successful with it? I'm like, well, you know, we understand the whole value chain and the whole need, what's required for additive, and we have control of it. You know, even, but even within our own business, that's a challenge because we have to find a place within our larger ecosystem where we can, say, manufacture the specific powders for additive, or how do we add different finishing capability, like, like Ron alluded to, you know, the surface fin finish isn't there. Um, in, in a lot of these technologies and also, you know, they still require finishing. So I think that is a miss, I think, in a lot of my customers that I talk to, that they don't really fully understand 
all the other requirements that you have for additive. It's like any other technology you're developing. When we do it at Kenna Metal, whether it's additive or I'm putting a grinding technology in or a finishing technology, we start at our tech center and we work through the needs for the product requirement and we develop a capable process. So once we have that developed and we've proven process capa capability, then we move it into our manufacturing operation. We've done the same thing with additive and been very successful doing it that way. Great, thank you. Craig, do you want to tell us, what are, what are you guys working on? You know, you're a national laboratory partnering with industry. How are you attempting to solve some of these problems? So um, I'm a true believer in uh, additive in terms of a preforming tool. So I don't think that we're going to get away from traditional processes. As a matter of fact, additive in its transforming, it's another tool in the toolbox. And so some of the, the big things that we've been pushing on lately is more towards the large scale and large scale castings. Uh, we have a system referred to as Medusa. It's a three arm arc welding machine where we can put down 100 pounds an hour. Um, we're looking heavy at castings where either they can't get them or they have lead times of 9, 18 months. And literally, we get calls from DOD supply chain where we can make a part in literally two to three days. And then you got a couple, two, three days of machining. And uh, I do agree with the, the volume and, and solids and those um, areas. But honestly, if we went back four or five years ago, I never thought in a million years that we'd be doing things like this, growing three and 4,000 pound parts. Um, it's low volume. Uh, I also want, you know, you heard several examples here today where, you know, it is in production. So if you do look at large scale, even arc welding, um, you got Lincoln and Cleveland close by here, right? I think they got 20, 27 machines making tooling every day, a lot for the aerospace industry. You got additive engineering solutions over in Ohio. They're printing parts every day. These are growing companies. We spun out a company, uh, Volunteer Aerospace, making Powder, from powder metallurgy parts. Um, they're just uh, acquired by Beehive, uh, yet a bigger. So there are examples, and, and I think the whole tooling area is ripe. And I think as we develop these processes for a larger and larger scale, we're going to get more implementation. So, and I'll talk a little bit more. The whole digital thread and qualification is a real big one that we've been focused on as well. Gary, tell us uh, what's behind the curtains there at CMU. What are you guys working on in the industry? Well, I think that the issues that are, have already been talked about in industry are things that are pushing a lot of our research forward. And, and yes, there are the new ideas. Uh, there's work on things like new materials, materials for high temperature, for example, for heat exchangers, which, by the way, that's would, you know, to make more efficient energy conversion systems, for example. Uh, materials like tungsten. How do you how do you do additive of tungsten? Right is is not uh, not an easy task, but the sort of thing we're tackling, along with other types of alloys and so on. So you know, under the covers, there's a lot of that that basic research. I think, kind of looking to the future and exactly these issues. It, I mean, I totally agree with what what Craig and and, and Ron were saying that or Ed was saying too that that. Uh, the additive machines, it's part, of, it's part of the process flow. It's not a microwave oven that you just pop something in and you get it out, or like the Star Trek replicator. Sorry, I'm, I'm dating myself. <laughs> um, you know, it, it, it requires you know, going to the next machine and the next machine, and then, and then you get it out. What we're looking at is you know, the vision of, well, how do we make that more seamless? How do we automate that? How do we make that a faster process, which of course then drives cost, and then cost drives adoption. So uh, I think in, in areas where customization is key, like tool and die, and you're doing one, two parts, um, you know, that's, that's certainly a sweet spot. If you're trying to make 10,000 large parts or, or a million large parts, you can't, you know, that's not going to happen right now. But could that happen in the future? Should it happen? Well, if, if you're going to use a lot of these lightweighting ideas and other design ideas that are unlocked by additive, the answer is, well, yes, that's what's going to push it, but you're not going to push back on cost. So we're looking at, for example, how do you create the, you said the digital thread, but really just the, the hierarchical digital twins of these machines and the processes 
and, and wrap around the software around that so that one can automate, take apart from additive, it's completely understood with computational modeling what its structure is, both internally but also on the surface, and then can automate the fixturing to go then into a subtractive machine, finish it, and get a beautiful part out, and have that all be, you know, is it, are there humans in the loop? Absolutely. But is it streamlined and automated? Yes. If you're doing large parts, then, you know, like I said, you've got at, at the manufacturing demonstration facility down in Tennessee, three robots building these things that are, you know, three meters tall. Um, I think that's just the beginning, but that, you know, how do you take that three, that three meter tall part and now, now I'm going to move that into a machining center and finish it off and not have that be, uh, you know, having people scratch in their heads, the humans going, hmm, okay, we got to, you know, customize all of that. It's all going to be streamlined. That's the kind of stuff we're working on. Yeah, that's a great vision. I think that really uh, kind of speaks to what we talked about earlier, the opportunity for added to support sustainability in the long term reduce all that travel time, all that interaction, yeah. downtime, and so forth. So, yeah, that, thank you for that. And material waste. And material You're waste, yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. So, um, John, you brought this up earlier, you know, the impact on supply chains. And so you mentioned that, John Lazinski, uh, as, you know, kind of a barrier to really the growth of the additives. So can you talk a little bit about that? Um, and also, you know, how are you helping to address that? I know one of the key factors is the business case for AI. So what are you doing to help uh, address those? Fantastic question. Yes, I think it's something that we're seeing. Um, I know I was, I was talking to a couple of folks earlier, and we were there was a recent trade show here in Chicago called IMTS, which many of you are probably familiar with. But one of the things that I, you know, I think I physically experienced some of what we're talking about here. So there was a lot of interaction between the very conventional manufacturing processes that we understand with the additive community for the first time maybe standing out a little bit more because there was more concentration of activity around, around additive. And one of the, the main takeaways that I had was, you know, it really is starting to feel a little bit more like another tool in the toolbox. Um, we, we've been saying that for years, but I don't think we're, I mean, there are, there are good use cases that the, the two organizations up here on stage are representing, but there's still not that many. I, I think that's one of our problems. So it goes back to your business case example. It is, it has been difficult for us to broadly explain where, when, and how to use it. I think, um, uh, the Barnes Group and, and the folks uh, John has on his team are experts in that. So there, there are people who are really good at being able to go in and work with an organization to help them understand that. But for someone like us at the institute level, we're trying to explain to you know the manufacturing base in a particular region, an area, whatever it might look like. So Petra mentioned uh, defense, defense manufacturing communities earlier, which which. Uh, this area represents one of, I think there's now 17 of them that exist in, in the country. We as an institute are part of, I think, 12 of them or something like that. So we're trying to get the word out broadly across these different communities. And it's challenging. You know, it, it, is, it has been difficult because there is a tremendous lack of awareness about the technology or they think it is something different than it is. I think. The, we use a term pretty regularly at the Institute called manufacturing realities. It's kind of a, a, a term that could be applied to some of what we're talking about here. It's, it's what can you really get out of the process, of which there are many different processes that we consider as additive. What does it mean when you consider material A, B, C, D, and that list goes on and on? In some cases we can do it. In other cases, we absolutely cannot do it, or we don't understand well how to apply additive. And that all makes my ability to answer your question complicated. I think it, it makes our ability to explain how to f address that business case in the overall value chain of additive manufacturing <clears throat> a bit of a difficult one, although we have you know, lighthouses or, or great use cases of where it does make sense. So, 
Some of the things that we're doing at the Institute were actually a, a few folks on the stage are part of this. There's been a large program funded through the uh, Department of Defense, particularly trying to address Army-related needs, specifically around sourcing of, um, you know, hard to source or being able to produce hard to source components. And the, the program is called AM Now, but it is really addressing, and, and we did this through demonstrations of which um, Catalyst Connection and TBGA were a, a big part of, of this program. How do we actually show people what works and when it works and how does it work? And, and while through a series of demonstrations learn what works, you know, how it works and when it works. And, and I think that we use those as lighthouses, if you will, to get the word out, get the story out, so that people can start to better understand where to apply the technology. I think that's the key. I think that's what we're, I would say, I'm you know, beginning to see uncover here. We are maturing as an industry. You know, we're, we're getting to the point where we don't need to have to solve every problem. That's not what additive is for. It's no different than you know, another technology. So I think we continue to work on that. This is not to undersell the capability by any means. It absolutely can fit in. It's about when does it fit in and where does it fit in, which I think is what we're, we're all up here trying to uh, figure out. I think if I could just tack on to that. So I think the, the industry has suffered from its own popularity because it, it's, it gets out there, but then everybody just says, oh, I saw Big Bang Theory, and you make uh, plastic figurines of yourself, and that's added manufacturing. <laughs> well, that's a form of it, but it's actually a, it's a family of technologies that ranges in, in size and spectrum and materials and everything else. And so I think roughly we say that additive is about 1% of global manufacturing, which means that 99% of manufacturing doesn't know what it, <laughs> what it is. So we've got a long way to go. Uh, that's that's probably the good news. Uh, there's, there's, it should be easier to get there. Thank you, John. And I was going to actually uh, turn to you lastly on this topic of the barriers. Uh, you described to us in 1991, Gary talked about the vision, it's possible to add it in. Um, not every community has a neighborhood uh, airport leader like we do, like Christina, that is willing to make this kind of leap and investment in space and infrastructure and so forth. How can other communities, what aspects of the 191 other communities uh, Well, I think it goes back to, I was, I was thinking about this a little bit, uh, you know, when I was a younger manager, uh, you read all these books, and I, there was always the quote, you know, culture eats strategy for lunch, and I never really understood it, and I was like, well, strategy is really important because without strategy, blah, blah, blah. Now I truly understand, and it's really been highlighted through the pandemic. If you didn't have a good culture, those couple, that year or so was not great for you. It, it, it exposed that uh, with a magnifying glass. So part ways of answering your question, I think that what, uh, you know, when Christina and, and her crew at the airport authority um, have exposed the culture of Pittsburgh and the region is a place where this can happen. You know, so first of all, there has to be a, a fertile ground to, with which to plant something in, I guess if I want to use a farming analogy. Um, because I, I'm not from Pittsburgh, I grew up in Atlanta, I don't know that this would be possible there. And it is similar to, to what we're seeing the federal government move in sort of, there's these national imperatives around industrial base, but they're now trying to address them more regionally. And so the defense manufacturing communities are you know, an output of that because the regions have things that they do well. And so what Pittsburgh does well is in you know, manufacturing sort of in our blood, and say I even said our, uh, so I'm becoming a native five, seven years in. Uh, but I always think, I think now, you know, the workforce is the new natural resource for Pittsburgh, you know, whereas before it might have been iron ore and coal, but really it's, it's that hundred years of making stuff is, is sort of what the region's used to doing. So I think that's like the first ingredient in success, and you know, people like Christina are, are really important because otherwise, you know, it might just be me, you know, sending emails out, "Hey, this is a good idea," uh, along with many others. Um, but there's um, uh, the industrial base analysis and sustainment organization within the Pentagon uh, has now uh, been working on some of these things, and have, we're starting to re we're helping them. You know, we're reducing this down to that there are. 12 success factors that make a region successful. So there's a little bit of science going into this now. And you know, number one is having a champion. So 
you know, I think the region acts as a champion here. So there's a lot, a lot of ways of answering your question, but I think, you know, starts with the, the bigger picture is the culture. You got to want to be in it for one, and you got to have uh, people to support it because, um, you know, on the, on the additive side, we see too many places that have 50 openings for additive engineers. At some point, it's easier to move your facility to where the engineers are rather than trying to recruit them from, you know, all over the world into, you know, a, maybe an undesirable location. Well, so far, from from uh, actually from the manufacturing standpoint, we've had had very good engagement. Uh, as we said, we don't see this as a as a replacement. We see it as a extension of our manufacturing capabilities. So, uh, approaching it with that mindset has been key. Uh, it's been mentioned already. This is not going to be a technology, and uh, from from any of the forms of additive that is, uh, we pull up a CAD model and we download it and we print out a, a completed part. It's part of a big, longer chain uh, of the full process. And, and having you know the teams fully aware of, of the, the shifting changes to this, what it means to the to the to the companies, to the industry, has been key. From the if we go away from the actual manufacturing part to the, to the design standpoint, uh, this has been actually the area that's, that's the, the largest change. Uh, you know, initial approaches to the manufacturing using additive was make the same parts just with a different process. And we've, we've been seeing a culture change that, you know, after, after hitting into that wall a couple times and, and not seeing the advancement that you wanted to or the benefits from it, you know, the, the culture has changed that you have to first understand the technology, have the people in place, um, that are capable uh, of, of expanding that technology, uh, investing into to learning in that area, but then using those learnings for what we can do with additive to then change our products. And that starts the whole way back at the very beginning when we're going through our, our design practices, uh, design for manufacturing, value engineering, changing the whole process and getting everybody involved with that. Um, really need to have the upfront as to what the capabilities are and then start using that to, to get our employees engaged, to using that to, to develop a new uh, environment for, for bringing out better designs, you know, using these, these new systems. Uh, overall, if we were to continue just down the, the, the previous path of uh, trying to apply it, you know, we were in a, in a uh, I guess, a environment of we had a solution and we we're now trying to find a problem to solve with it instead of the alternative, which is figure out what, what our tools are we have in the toolbox, and now use that, apply it, you know, for, for known problems. So, so we, engagement along the entire process, I think, is key. Engagement early yeah, in the process on, yeah, has been absolutely. the key for us for, for adopting this technology. Yeah. yeah, thanks. John, any more comments on that? Yeah. Share with us the, leader, the important role of leadership. Yeah, yeah so two, two, I think. One is, from a macro level, you know, what, Additive is really just another form, it's an industry 4.0 technology, it's an automated technology. So it, it does reduce touch labor, but to be fair, we have a skill shortage of labor in the country anyway. So it's actually part of the solution. You know, let's use the humans for what they're actually better at, not repetitive tasks. Things would actually require a brain. And, and so at the, and then on the other end of the spectrum, you know, and I think we've probably got two good examples here. You, you know, most companies have chosen this path of convincing 12 PhDs that this is a thing, uh, how you then throw that against the 10,000 engineering strong organization that they have and how do you translate that, that learning and, and you know, the skills and the training that go with it, uh, you know, that's really the next step. And, and so that, that part's less obvious. Uh, you know, we're, we, we like to think we're part of that solution, but you know, we're a 20 person organization. So, First, first, people got to acknowledge that they have a problem, <laughs> and then uh, and, you know, the second part is going about solving it. But, but that, there's that enterprise problem. That's a great segue to Gary because uh, you're one of the leading uh, schools in the world uh, for engineers and PhDs. So, how are you helping to address this problem? How are you engaging more students and getting them excited about this field so they can join industry and help grow the sector? Well, it, um, yeah, I think it's critical, and, and I think the um, workforce is, is a critical 
piece of the puzzle. You know, without, without the trained workforce, all of this technology isn't going to be helpful. Um, and I, I think for on the Carnegie Mellon side, uh, it all starts uh, at, at the you know, individual course, uh, the courses that get taught along with the projects that get uh, made in the research. And so that starts quite honestly with the faculty uh, deciding that they could work on anything, any application. You know, we have experts in machine learning and artificial intelligence and, and even in, in mechanical engineering. And do they have to work on manufacturing? No. You know, it has to be a voluntary thing that they're saying, these sectors, this, this application area, I'm going to apply my knowledge to. And our job in the Institute is to help pull that in. So part of this starts with them, and then they bring in, they educate the students, they bring in the students in projects. And it's not just the PhD students, it's the, the undergraduates, the master's students who are professional students, they want to go get a good job. They want, you know, two years and be out in industry and doing, doing things. Um, and it's about the outreach. So I think it's also important to realize, is just reinforcing what, what um, John and Ron have already said, which is, is that you know, this is part of this larger ecosystem. It's not just additive. Additive by itself is, is not where the power of this digital revolution is. It's a piece of it. <coughs> so it's the same thing when we're educating. It's not like we're going to educate students, go, oh, you're going to learn how to run a 3D printer and you know job well done and now you go off in industry no they need to understand the the holistic view of the digitalization they need to understand about model based systems engineering how how cad and cam systems interact how to do generative design for new designs for additive they need to understand at the back end the opportunities for you know manufacturing as a service you know, there's lots of things that our students at, at that undergrad level are going to go out and change the world if they have that basis and, you know, they'll be snapped up by the companies you see up here on stage, I hope. Yeah, great. That's, well, that's another great segue. So, yeah, tell us uh, what's happening at Kenamental. Yeah, so I think Gary mentioned something that kind of resonated with me and, you know, like, I, I agree with everything the guy said and I think just to pile on, you know, we use it it's been an excellent tool for us not only to attract talent but to retain talent you know because because people want to be part of an innovative company you know and we've worked together um, we have our additive teams that work under me but you know we collaborate and we have rotations in and out we bring engineering in you know we have a we have a team that only focuses on generative design to solve customer problems you know we have customers who come to us and, and have you know like uh, a good example, we have recent examples out there in, in uh, EV stator bore machining where we've used generative design to solve customer problems. And, and you know, I've had people come to me even internally, it's like, I didn't know we were doing that in the company. You know, so, so we are really trying to educate the company, provide opportunities, um, like I said, not only to attract talent, but in today's workplace to retain the talent that we have. And it's been it's been an excellent tool for us. Uh, yeah, I really like that comment. I think that's the power of all of the Industry 4.0 technologies. Young people in particular want to be part of that excitement. So John, tell us, uh, how do we do that? How do we get more people excited about uh, additive and advanced technologies? I think another another good segue, it, it, for us it is, you know, broader. So we're, we're looking at all of the various ways that we need to consider training either students or a workforce. And we, we use the term K to gray. So from early education up through the end of their career, we need to understand how do we continually educate our workforce in new technology. So in this case, in additive manufacturing. So we've, we've adopted kind of a career pathways approach to education where there are at any point in time, whether it's prior to your career starting, which is an area where we do quite a bit of work actually, there, there's fantastic universities that have you know, additive ingrained within their programs. You know, and there are, in, in some cases, good uh, examples of how early education in middle schools and elementary schools, you know, we've started to consider additive. That's certainly not pervasive. So it's something that we're trying to 
influence and, and ultimately impact so that students are coming up with an understanding of what the technology is, how to use it. But maybe more importantly right now, uh, one of the things that we're working on is, is kind of focusing on the folks who are already out in the workforce today. And how do we get them, one, even to be aware that this is an opportunity for them, and then how do we create a pathway that they can come in and out of you know, growing their understanding about the technology as they either need, you know, based on the career that they want to you know, pursue, or maybe it's just continuing education for the work that they're doing within the field that they are currently uh, operating. So those, those are areas that we're working, but from, you know, it, we're also not necessarily a training-based organization, so we don't, we don't employ trainers per se, we again are trying to convene industry and coordinate how training programs are actually built so that we're building them in a way that then are, you know, accredited is not the right word, but there, there is some basis by which these programs are built so that folks can then move around the workforce so that they actually have credentials that are meaningful as they move from job to job within a company or even company to company. So, from our point of view as a national institute, we're trying to identify what this educational landscape looks like and how to get engaged and then ultimately make visible programs that have been vetted by industry and are, you know, effectively you know, gold starred by industry that people can know if I take this, it will be recognized by you know, folks on the stage and that will give me, put me in a better position to advance my career. So those, those, from the Institute's point of view, that's, that's how we're looking to address it. Yeah, I really like that because, you know, you don't want people to think, well, if I didn't get a chance to be an engineer from CMU, then I'm out of this uh, opportunity. And that's definitely not the case. And you're developing those on-ramps for people, which I think is so important. So, Craig, you're going to get the last word on this uh, this panel on this very important topic. What, how is the laboratory thinking about this whole topic of workforce? So um, I, I'm glad that we talked about this, and it's kind of been touched on. I think this is the most significant thing that additive has done. It's breathed life into manufacturing. And when I was younger, manufacturing smokestacks, you have young people that are excited, and they come into the additive manufacturing, and they leave being in machine tools, and they leave being in composites. It's become an attractive force. Um, we're a laboratory of 5,700 people. Even our neutron scientists want to get into the MDF. They want to be part of this. It, it's new. It's, it's exciting. Um, all the students that we bring in all have jobs when they leave. Uh, we've grown over the pandemic by 100 just in the additive area, and 80% of our, our new hires are under five years. So it's really transformed, I think, the way people are looking at, at, at manufacturing in a very positive way. And once they get exposed to manufacturing, there's just a wealth of opportunity other than additive. Additive is another tool in the tool chest. And, and it's going to continue to evolve. It's going to become part of like basically the, the, the ecosystem in terms of manufacturing. So I'm excited about where it's at. We have training as well. Uh, we're working with various universities. Um, it's, still, it's still very, very popular, and we get a lot of young people coming to it. So I think it has a very bright future. Yeah, that's excellent. Thank you, uh, Craig, and thank you for uh, ending us here on such a high note. I really appreciate it. Panelists, thank you so much for sharing your experiences. Everyone, uh, thanks for your attention. I see uh, Simon is here, so she's uh, taking over the podium. Thank you again. <laughs>